Okay, welcome. We're going to be talking about new hope for, Addis for uh, Alzheimer's disease. Six months ago in, this, in the senior center, I gave a lecture on Alzheimer's. What I'm going to tell you today, I had no idea about. I'd never heard of it. And it was in June of this year that a friend of mine did a webinar. And, and some of the slides I'm going to show you has some of the content. And one of the things I say is Alzheimer's is untreatable disease. Okay, that has changed. It didn't change six months ago. It's been changing the last few years. But what I'd like to do is explain to you as best I can, as simply as I can, what is behind this shift from virtually nothing you could do for Alzheimer's to new hope for Alzheimer's. And it's based upon the Bredesen Protocol. Okay. I'm Dr. Wes Howard. I've been giving a bunch of lectures here called Hope for Health because I know as you get older, you start worrying about your health. And Alzheimer's is probably the most complicated disease there is. That's what Dale Bredesen says. And so it's not been easy to figure out. And I'll show you what happened from not understanding it and doing all kinds of things that never worked to now something's making substantial difference for it. Six months ago, I showed this slide. And it says, despite the millions, billions of dollars spent on research, there is still neither a cure nor an effective treatment for the disease. Alzheimer's is basically a death sentence. My mother died of Alzheimer's over in Bridgewater Retirement Community. She had it for 15 years, got to the point where she didn't recognize me at the end of her life. She'd smile at me, and I thought, I don't know what's going on in that brain, but I said, I'm your son and you're my mother. Okay, she died of that. Okay, so, and many of you could tell me stories of the long goodbye, because that's what it is. The person's body continues, whoever they are is gone, okay? And until now, there's virtually been almost nothing. We, I know there's some drugs out there, Aricept and Amenda. They do a little bit, but you will find out they don't do enough, obviously. And virtually, when a person started having memory decline, not much was done. Not much even diagnostically, even though there could have been, because there was the feeling, well, there's nothing you could do, just prepare to die. Um, this is one of Dale Bredesen's statements. Everyone knows a cancer survivor, but up until now, nobody knows an Alzheimer's survivor. And now, to get this book, I'm not going to give the, the, the stories of people, but they're amazing stories of people that have gone from solid Alzheimer's to back to being functional, a businessman that was so productive, had two offices, he began getting cognitive decline, got to the point where he was in his house, he could say a sentence, that was it. He went through the protocol, he went back to opening a third office. I mean, that is like resurrection from the dead, you know, medically miraculous, and that is what we're seeing. So Alzheimer's disease is a death sentence until now. Now there is hope. And this is the book. Only came out last month. Top of the New York bestseller. And Dale Bred, I've got a signed copy here because Dale Bredesen is a delightful man. Very smart. He's not the only one that figured this out. It took a team, actually all over the world, researchers working on this for almost 30 years. And you'll get an idea of what they put together. That's my, that's my, what I'm wanting to deliver to you. This is Dale Bredesen. His name is all over it, but he's not the only person. It's been a lot of people. And what's, what they've come up with is a 90% reversal. Now, that's either crazy. You know, you hear that for something that there's no hope, and you think, oh, this has got to be somebody's selling shark oil, you know? Okay. Um, it is not shark oil. This is the real thing. This is, the, this is an article from 2014 in which 10 patients were reported. And... <clears throat> One of them had had Alzheimer's for 11 years. Now, I'll caution you. What they continue to say is start early and start up front. In fact, I will tell you, start before you have any symptoms. Because we all have Alzheimer's drivers in our lives, factors that will push us towards Alzheimer's. But of these 10 patients, 90 of them completely reversed. In fact, what Dale Bredesen says, they've now done this this protocol for up to five years, and he says there is nobody that is involved in this, this regimen full speed who has even shown any mental decline. 
So it seems like they have not only solved Alzheimer's, but they figured out what brain health needs. And so uh, he's not saying, again, you don't want to promise these people will never decline. And then there's one person, one woman, a story in the book, of a woman that got so bad she went through the protocol and she noted, you know what, my brain didn't come back the way it was. I'm now thinking like I was 30 years old. Better than I, before I got Alzheimer's. So this is my simple verdict on this. Okay, I'm a, I've been a doctor four years. I've, I've been around a lot. I know the medical system and I have looked as well as I can, and this, I think this is it. These people have figured out not everything about Alzheimer's. I'll get to the point where I say there's 36 known drivers, and Dale Bredesen says there's probably a few more. He doesn't think there's a lot, 50 maybe, and that's, that's part of the secret. But what led to the lifting of the fog on cognitive decline? I mean, many of you have firsthand stories of how you've watched a loved one, a spouse, or family member just decline to the point where they die. What, what was the old paradigm and how did it change? That's what I want you to understand. Okay, the 20th, <clears throat> we treated like the antibiotic era. In the era of antibiotics, you had one bug causing one disease for which you gave one or maybe a few antibiotics. Okay, that's a very important workable hypothesis or paradigm. But that has been the paradigm that they've been pursuing with Alzheimer's. It doesn't work. It doesn't work because it's not one cause, one treatment, one drug. In fact, Dale Bredesen says that'll never be true. If you've got 36 factors, you can't do it with one thing. Um, the one drug hypothesis led to the following. Between 2002 and 2012, there were 244 clinical trials of a modality using a drug to reverse Alzheimer's. 243 were total failures, and one was hardly worth even marketing. That's the history. What does that cost? Billions of dollars to find one thing. And what they did is they went back and looked. I, I gave this slide six months ago. Alzheimer's is a lifestyle disease. So many of the factors have been known for a long time. For instance, um, diabetes. Insulin resistance is one of the biggest drivers in Alzheimer's. Well, doctors have known that for a long time. If you have diabetes, you're at much higher risk of getting Alzheimer's, okay? Well, they thought, well, oh, that's not significant enough that we should do something about it. But if you look at each one of these and you add them up, in total, they give you a big impact. And so part of what they've done is take things we know, but everybody's pushed off as, oh, that's not significant. They brought those things together. They've also found a lot of new things, which I'll show you. And the paradigm shift is to say, Alzheimer's is a life disease. You cannot fix it with one drug or one thing. It must be a modality of many things. Here's the picture. If you can remember this picture, a barn with 36 holes in the roof. Okay, if that's your barn, and you want it to stop getting wet on the barn floor, you don't poke up one hole, you don't fill one hole. Aricept and Amenda actually are good drugs, they, they fill one hole. What does that do for the whole disease? It doesn't do much. Okay, so if you want to treat this disease, you need to know what those holes are, and you need to fill not all of them, but enough of them to get the rain from coming in. Now, this is a, the next slide is going to be a busy slide. Let me just explain it. This is a slide that says the perfect Alzheimer's drug would, and this describes all 36 things that have been found to contribute to Alzheimer's. Okay, so it's, it's what a perfect drug would do, and Dale Bredesen's purpose is to say, you'll never get one drug that does all 36 of these things. Not possible. He says, you know, there might be improved drugs later on that you you know, I'm from traditional medicine. We put a lot of our hope in drugs. And as a lifestyle doctor, I come to the point of saying, you know, your health, forget Alzheimer's, your health is determined by your lifestyle, not drugs. You know, some of you are on multiple drugs, and they might help you a little bit, but they're not going to make you well. So one, not one thing, but many things. 36 unique issues. Some 
were known before, some are brand new understanding, and some take a lot of tests and a lot of studies to do. Okay, so if you were to look at this, these all contribute. These do not all contribute to every person, but with a given person, the whole approach is to find out what is driving this person's cognitive decline. It's a multimodal approach. It's not a one-size-fits-all. Here's the problem with this approach. It is not one thing, so how do you study it scientifically? If you know anything about randomized clinical trials, double-blind placebo, it doesn't work on this. This is a different treatment for every single person. So scientifically, well, okay, you go back to the fact that these people are reporting. Now, I've talked to some people who are hard -bold skeptics that said 10 patients? Is that all? Well, they're soon going to publish 50 patients, but their experience consistently has been that they can, tr they can reverse up to 90% of the people. And they start defining, you've got to get them early, you don't want these late, you don't want traumatic brain injury, things like that. I'll show you. Okay. Now, 36 things is too complicated. Okay, maybe they know all those things. Well, scientists now take those 36 things, they start looking at them, and they say, you know what? There's six types. There's six types of Alzheimer's. And so they've gone from 36 to six. So part of the Bredesen protocol, and I'm going to say two things at the end. If you want to figure out how to do this yourself, get the book, study it. There's lots of things you can do. I'll tell you some of them. And it can it maybe make your brain a lot better. But the protocol is very heavy diagnostically to find out all the things. And then it, it uses a computer program to spit out what is your tailored therapeutic modalities. Okay. The, uh, the six types, again, I can't explain all these. It takes too long. But go to the book. There's an inflammatory, either due to infection or sterile. Inflammation is a big driver. Now, notice they skip from 1 to 2, and then they come back to 1.5. Atrophic simply means your brain does not have what it needs to be healthy. That's all kinds of things. That's from hormones to nutrients, B12, um, other things like that. And then they came back to glycotoxic, one of the most common ones, and as they say, the most self-inflicted. It has to do with sugar and insulin resistance. Huge driver of Alzheimer's. The third type, toxic, and I'll go into this. This is one of the more complicated things. There's all kinds of toxins. We know we live in a toxic environment, but there's some toxins that they learned about. Vascular, if you have bad atherosclerosis, it's bad for your brain. And the final one is traumatic, like the NFL players that have chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This is the least treatable. It's not any of these paradigms. So, um, but just look at one thing. One of these things is increased insulin sensitivity. Okay, that's a drug would increase insulin sensitivity. Metformin, well, actually, metformin is not good for your brain, so there's a problem there. But insulin resistance is a big driver. Now, let me, so this, the 36 things, okay, that's part of understanding the paradigm shift. Let me give you another aspect. Again, I don't want to make this complicated, but it's not a simple thing. I'm trying to give you an understanding. What do they have to do? Well, balance. Human live systems are a balance of different factors. How many of you have dealt with osteoporosis? Okay. If you have understood osteoporosis at all, osteoporosis is not one thing. It's a balance of things. Your body is constantly tearing down your bone and rebuilding it constantly all the time. Not just when you're young, when you're old. So osteoporosis is an imbalance between what's called osteoclastic, which is tearing down, and osteoblastic, which is building up. Every living system in your body has this constant remodeling. And there are factors that go into that. The 36 things feed into tearing down or building up. So just like osteoporosis, one of the paradigm shifts is instead of being one thing, they started to think, this has to be a balance of these things. And what is a balance? If you start having cognitive decline, it means the balance has gone from tearing your brain down and not building it up enough. 
That's that's kind of what Alzheimer's is about. Okay, I try. I I wanted to get a picture of a house that was both being torn apart and built up at the same time. I couldn't find one, but so here's what I got. On the right is your house is being dismantled with a big piece of machinery, and on the other hand side, it's being built up. Your brain is being both reprocessed, old dead cells and toxins and things like that are being taken out of your brain. At the same time, it's being, it's being uh, built up. You know, your brain is a lot more plastic. I'm not taking, talking about made of plastic, but your brain, one of, the, one of the results of this research is to find out, you know what, we have a lot more ability to regenerate our brain, even at our age. That's good news. Because if you take things away that are adding to the dismantling, dismantling has to go on. It's a healthy process. If you get a cell that's old and aging, you want to get rid of it and replace it with a new cell. But if you have too much of that, Dale said it's like having your house and deciding you need a remodeling job, so you have to hire the demolition crew and the building crew. Guess what if the demolition crew shows up every day and the building crew shows up once a month? You've got a downsizing of your house, and that's what Alzheimer's is. So, so it's a balance of these two. It's not an either-or. So a balancing of both the dismantling and the synthesizing that's going on every day. Now, let me just show you. Uh, <clears throat> this is a picture that's often used for Alzheimer's, but it's a healthy brain on the left and a, a downsizing brain on the right. Okay, 36 things. And let's say in a com I take one of you and I completely evaluate you and I say, of the 36 things, you know what? 11 are good and 25 are bad. So which way are you tipped? You're tipped towards the downsizing of your brain. So what do you do? Well, what you do is you find out which of those things you can alter or move in the other side to positive, and we're still going to have some negative things. But if you tip the balance enough, you start your brain starts coming back to life. One of the things that Dale noticed, he's been working with people for a long time, but this one wife said about her husband, you know what the thing is, the thing I noticed, it takes, it can take up to three to six months of really doing this thing hardcore before a person, sh but this wife said, you know the thing you didn't notice is he stopped declining. This is a guy that's brain was just going like that and all of a sudden he stops declining in three to six months He's coming back up the other side. So let me look at that again. So going from a bad balance, 36 things. If I could plug you in a machine, it would show the 36 things, and it would tally up negatives and positives. And then it would tell you what to do. What do you need to do? Now, do you need to do them all? No, you don't need to do them all. You need to do enough. It's just like osteoporosis. You need to do enough. And the frustration is different doctors tell me different things. Let me give you one other thing. Again, this is a picture that this is amyloid precursor protein, one of the final common pathways. This is a key molecule in your brain, in the synapses. And this shows you that it boils down to what happens to this protein in the middle. There are forces that would cut that protein in three different places and create four molecules, one of which is beta amyloid. I'll get to amyloid in just a minute, but beta amyloid is one of those things. All four of these are bad for your brain. So if you've got enough factors that it pushes it that way, you've got a brain in decline. And you know what? Your brain has to decline for 20 10, 15, 20 years before you start showing the signs of Alzheimer's. So probably everybody in the room has it. <laughs> you just don't know you have it yet. Okay. The, the, this amyloid pro precursor protein can be cut in two places, in one place, and go to the left, and those are all beneficial to the positive rebuilding of the brain, making new synapses, you know, keeping your brain healthy. So if we measure you again, and most of those things are on the side where your brain is 
taking this thing and cutting it and this bad stuff, you got too much amyloid. What we have to do is find out how can we take some of those things, and again, not all things are equal. Not all 36 are equal. Not all 25 are equal. How do you decide what's the main driver? Remember the six different types? In the end, I'll show you this program comes up with your main driver. Oh, by the way, this is your secondary driver and your third driver. You better address your primary driver, your second driver, and as much of the others as you can if you want to get a balance. So that's what happens. Um, I think what I'm going to do is skip these because it's just saying the same thing in a different way. It's those 36 things. Now, cognitive decline takes a long time to develop. Dale Bredesen said, and we're all, we're all over 45, right? Okay, none of us is young spring chicks. He, he could take everybody in this room. Let's say that you're in perfect health and your brain works perfectly. He said at your age, if he evaluated, he would, five, he would find three to five things in these 36 that are, are your weaknesses. Now, you may have such a strong brain, you could live to 90, and even if you developed another 10 of those things, your brain would be in such good shape that even as the dismantling's going more than the building, you've still got enough reserve. <laughs> That's why God made us two kidneys, because you move, remove one, you still got some reserve. You got some reserve in your brain. But, but uh, some people, as they decline, their reserve starts going away. But, okay, so you've got preclinical. That's when it starts. And you'll see that Doug Bredesen advises all of us at 45 to 50, get what's called a cognoscopy. Get our brains checked out. Okay, then you go into what's called subjective cognitive impairment. That's where your wife doesn't know, your hairdresser doesn't know, only you know that you have some problems. <laughs> and you're functionally seem to be fine. But then mild cognitive impairment, there's technical definitions to this, is uh, senior moments, can't remember her name or their name, and then you become much more disabled. And it takes a variety of different presentations. Um, but the thing to do is to find it early, up, early on and what they say is if you get somebody preclinical, MCI, early Alzheimer's, this will work. Nobody's going to say 100%, but this is the thing to do. This is the way to reverse that. Okay, amyloid. Paradigm shift. Amyloid is the problem? Well, not really. There was a whole era of research where they developed all these things, even vaccine that would go into the brain and take the amyloid out. Guess what? Some people got no better, some got worse. Amyloid is not the problem to begin with. In fact, amyloid is part of the body's defenses against three things, perturbations. Dale Bredesen likes big words, so that's three attacks on your brain. Remember, inflammation, trophic factors, and toxins. That's one, two, and three, type one, two, and three. Amyloid is actually created by your brain to fight these things, so it's a good thing to begin with. It's not the problem, it's not the enemy to begin with. It actually fights against toxins by binding them and keeping them from destroying your brain. But amyloid continues. Once your brain, your brain is up there and it senses that I'm being attacked by these different things, some of these 36 things are starting to turn against me, amyloid is produced. But then what happens is your brain starts downsizing. Because just like the CEO of a company, let's say that a company is very successful and productive, and all of a sudden their sales fall off down to 10%. So the CEO starts saying, hey, we better, we better change our, our protocol. We better stop hiring. We better stop ordering all these supplies. And so what they do is they appropriately downsize the company. So it can remain functional, and, and this is what happens to your brain. It begins to downsize. It figures, I can't keep up this level of function, so I better, for instance, let me give you a practical example. If you, if you are in cognitive decline, and you watch a TV program one night, the next morning you can't remember what it was, a lot of people can remember the important things in their life. Your brain is making a functional decision. Remembering that program last night was not important. Forget it. 
your brain actually makes that decision. But you better remember where who your wife was. Because <laughs> when you start when you start forgetting, actually, let me tell you, I'll tell you, I have experienced mental decline about my wife and I, my family and I moved to Kenya. I came back. I actually was working in prompt care uh, before I got back into the ER. I did ER medicine for 30 years. And my strongest memory was visual memory. When I worked in an ER, I, when we moved here 33 years ago, I worked in the Waynesboro ER. There's no hospital in Waynesboro now. But I could, rem I could take care of a patient, and I would look at that patient's face, and I would say, two years ago, I took care of you over here in bed too. I can remember that. I was working in prompt care, and I, I didn't really know what was going on, but one day I was taking care of a patient. I looked at him and thought, hmm, I've never seen this patient before. Guess what? I'd seen him the day before. <laughs> now, it turned out I had pernicious anemia. And it's a long story, but basically pernicious anemia is an autoimmune disease. You can't absorb B12. Well, without B12, your brain doesn't work. <laughs> so. And there's a technical term for this loss of ability to see, recognize faces. I've regained that. But, but that was my experience, completely reversed with B12. That's one of the, can be one of the manifestations. But basically, your brain starts to downsize. And here's a little, Alzheimer's disease is a disease of protecting and downsizing the brain. Okay. Now, we all know what downsizing is. It's a good thing if you're getting old and you can't do what you used to do. But what I have learned through this whole thing is, you know, our brains have the potential for more health than we realize, even in old age. So following this can be extremely beneficial, even if you don't have a problem. Okay, now, let me give you some of the other elements. For two years, I've been practicing lifestyle medicine. And some of you have heard lectures I've done. And basically it's this. I actually was converted from traditional medicine. I'm still a traditional medical doctor. But I, my eyes were open to the fact that lifestyle is what determines our health. If you're not healthy today and you have a chronic Western disease, most of those are caused by your lifestyle. I found that most people don't want to deal with that. <laughs> they like their lifestyle. They don't want to be torn away from it. And so a lot of the reversal diseases, type 2 diabetes, ischemic heart disease, can be completely reversed. But, you know, a lot of people, even if they know that, don't want to do it. But the thing that was missing in my paradigm is, is diagnostic evaluation of people that do the best in their lifestyle, which my wife and I have done for seven, eight years now. And there's still some things that aren't quite right, and that's genes and toxins and evaluate a person's status. That's what this has done to me, is bring back the value of the di I mean, Western medicine, if it's good in anything, is good in diagnosis. In fact, we're so good in diagnosis, we over-diagnose people. You know, the whole thing of screening, mammographies and PSAs, is now a dilemma because Americans want to know everything. But you know what? You don't need to know everything. You shouldn't know everything because you'll be healthier if you go that way. But genes are a big thing in this. My wife and I, in our... A month ago, we were in Dallas learning how to practice this. Sunday night, we flew from Dallas to San Diego, where this guy that introduced this to us actually put us through this protocol. We're still in the process of going through it. It's not easy. We'll talk about that at the end. But, but genes are an important part of it. And part of what they want us to do is get 23andMe. Now, I'm going to come to the point where I recommend that to most people, because you'll find some things you will not know any other way about your genes. And some of those predispose you to Alzheimer's. Some of those predispose you to problems that can lead to Alzheimer's. Um, this is one of the biggest ones, APOE4. Anybody in here know your APO4 status? OK. It is the chief genetic driver of Alzheimer's. And we have known about this for a long time, but there are people one of the guys that discovered the DNA, Cricker, Watson, I think this is the story, did not, they wanted their, their genes sequenced and told them, but they didn't want to know what their APO for because they thought there's nothing I can do. So why would I want to know something that's going to do me in? But now there's something you can do. 
But if you have APO, I, gave, I showed this slide six months ago. If you have APO one copy or two copies, if you have two copies, the statistics are 50 to 90% of those people will get Alzheimer's. But this, this program can actually reverse that. It's not a sentence of death. It's very important to know. Another thing is your methylation status. Some of you know about this, some of you don't. We, we need vitamin B12, vitamin B6, and folate, but those have to be methylated. And there is this T, MTHFR gene mutation that puts people at relative risk of not being able to methylate it the way they should. So they actually need, just need to take methyl B12, methyl B6, and methyl folate. Okay, and it's not, it's not exactly that simple, but that's, that's the idea. If you know this, now you can, you can not know this and go out and buy methyl, methylated um, vitamins. Okay, but I think diagnostically it's important to know what's in your deck and what you need to work against. Okay, another thing, toxins. Un unfortunately, this is a big thing in, in dementia. And... In the process of working this out, what this group that's working on this found some drivers of dementia that were totally unknown, and one is mold. Mold is a huge, ugly driver, and we have wet places in the world like Houston and the, where the hurricanes hit, but they found people that as they dug in and tried to figure out what was causing their dementia, they couldn't figure it out. Finally, they found out it was a mold in their house or it was a mold in the place they work. Not any mold, but there's certain molds, and it's not that the mold infected them, but molds crank out all kinds of toxins. And 25% of the population has a metabolic susceptibility to those molds. My wife and I just got some labs back, and we, back, we both have that, genet that metabolic sensitivity to toxins. That was not good news. <laughs> we don't know if it's molds or not yet, but 75% but of people have the ability to fight them and not be affected by them. So in a family, there may be one person that begins to decline mentally because there's molds, and it doesn't mean that this is something you know. They have a Hertz me test, you bring it in, you collect, and they're looking for DNA of molds. It's a whole diagnostic thing. The treatment, it, I'm not going to go into that, it's very complicated, but there are all kinds of biotoxin triggers. There's both molds, but there's also some of these really sneaky. There's a lot of tick-borne Lyme disease. Everybody with Lyme, 50% of those people have a co-infection, and sometimes that's the thing that causes their uh, Alzheimer's. Again, I'm not trying to make this complicated. It is complicated for some people. Uh, my wife and I did a test <laughs> where we swabbed our nose and sent it in. Turns out I have a bacteria, not this one. This is called Marcons. They have found that a fair number of people have a multiple antibiotic resistant staph in their nose. It may not even give you symptoms, but it's cranking out toxins out of your sinuses. Your brain is right there, and it's one of the significant contributors of Alzheimer's. Another thing is gingival problems. Notice it says dental amalgams because mercury is not a, is a neurotoxin. Some people have bad root canals that end up with a kind of a chronic infection. I'm not saying everybody with a root canal has this. Um, poor oral hygiene, gingivitis. There's some people, when they're evaluated, their primary driver is infections in their mouth. And so dental hygiene becomes a part of this. Um, we have known that dental hygiene has a big part of your heart. Heart health can be directly related to dental hygiene, but now it's true of your brain also. So toxins are a big part of this. So as you notice, as we went through the six types, type three is toxins. And toxins can be heavy metals. When Jackie and I were out in San Diego, we, there's a place, I uh, can't remember the name of it, but we did, clipped off a piece of hair, <laughs> some urine and some blood went to a lab and they sent it off to this place that is the, the, the ultimate place to evaluate you for all these heavy metals. We haven't had that come back yet, but there are people, this story in the book, a guy who becomes rich 
says, man, I'm rich. I can eat sushi every day. Eat sushi every day. Comes in, guess what? His mercury is sky high. He's been eating fish with mercury in it. And so they detox him. They, and mercury is actually one of the easier metals to deal with. They bring it down. The guy's brain clears up. So, so, but there's all kinds of toxins. Notice the first one is the standard American diet. I'll get to diet in a minute. But there's a chapter in the, in the book called, if you want to give yourself Alzheimer's, this is the way you do it. It's the all-American lifestyle. We probably have a higher instance of Alzheimer's in this culture than any culture in the world. So toxins. Imaging is part of this. I throw this in because with MRIs, there's a part of your brain called the hippocampus. And they can actually show shrinking of the hippocampus. They have to do volumetrics. And they have been able to show with this treatment that part of your brain begins to come back. In fact, this funny story they'll tell us is, you know, as they were doing cutting edge research, they would have a person do an MRI, and then a year later they'd do an MRI and the radiologist would say, wait a minute, there's a problem here. This old one is smaller than the new one. That's ne that doesn't ever happen. It never comes back. And, and so they actually changed the reading, and Dale came and said, no, wait a minute. This person is in a program where they can actually regrow some parts of their brain. A PET scan, very specific, it looks at glucose use of the, um, the temporal and the frontal part of your brain that shows that you don't handle glucose correctly. Now, do you need these? It depends on uh, what's going on with you. I'm, let me show you one other thing. Uh, and I put this in, because, not because it's part of the diagnostic protocol, but there's drugs that are commonly used that are dementogenic. The number one over-the-counter sleep medicine is Benadryl. It is not good for your brain. I hate doing that. <laughs> Don't have a panic attack. Um, but there's other things. Statins for cholesterol are not good for people's brains. PPIs, Nexium, stomach. I mean, they turn off the acid in your stomach. Now, it seems like everybody goes to a gastroenterologist, gets put on one of those, and they get put on for years. Those things... And I'm not saying that that is causing a specific person's mental decline, but those are, and you can go to agingbraincare.org and look up whatever you're on because there are some common things that can make a difference if you stop using them. Okay, Dale Bredesen is often asked, okay, uh, what's the most important thing I could do? What's the most important thing I could do? And this is a, this is a list of the different types, and they give them, for instance, inflammatories called hot, atrophic cold, plecotoxic sweet, toxic vile, vascular pale, and traumatic dazed. But when asked, what can I do, and the person means, what can I go out and do? What can I start doing? Can I take turmeric? Can I take vitamins? Can I take this and that? He says the most important thing is to get an accurate diagnosis. And what I'm going to recommend at the end, if you don't want to go through this whole thing, which I can understand, get the book, put into practice what you can, and if you get better, great. But if you really want the best, it's to go through a fairly involved diagnostic process. Now, again, American culture is highly dementogenic. <laughs> if you want, and you know, again, read the book. I mean, he's talking about people that stay up late, people that burn the candle at both ends, you know. They're not taking themselves, care of themselves in any way. And one of the simple ways that uh, Dale Bresson describes this is what's called, you know, the Bermuda Triangle where airplanes and ships are supposed to disappear. He says, well, there's the Berfuda Triangle, which is the all-American way of eating highly processed foods, saturated fats, and low-fiber diets. He says, that's the kiss of death for your brain. If you eat that way, you may have a strong enough brain that you will never show anything. But if you have a fragile brain, that may show up. And what he recommends is unprocessed foods, low on animal sources, and high fiber diets. Let me just give you a few things. Ken, there's no way I can explain this all to you. As many of you know, I'll just give you a little hint on this one. As many of you know that have heard me lecture, my recommendation is a whole food plant-based diet. No processed, no animal stuff. That's not their paradigm. They are very heavily into plants, unprocessed plants, as you'll see on this one. 
This is one of their recommendations. Nine cups of vegetables and fruits. Becky and I say, I don't think we eat nine cups of anything. <laughs> it's hard to get nine cups, but they say, first and foremost, you've got to have a lot of plants. And you don't want to ruin them. You don't want to process them. You don't want to make white sugar, white flour, things like that. This is one of the, this is too complicated, but let me just point out a few things. They are not in favor of grains and not in favor of gluten. So they basically say, get grains, get gluten, gluten off the table. That's their recommendation, okay? They're also into good fats, okay? Um, and they're into ketogenesis, which I'll explain in just a minute. So their diet is called the Ketoflex 12-3. And in a minute, I'll show you what that means. Because this is what actually one of the more tangible things you can actually think about and do. It requires a change of your lifestyle, but it's brain healthy. Let me tell you. They're into low glycemic. They see sugar as being one of the biggest drivers of this. And so what do you want to do when you eat things, even if you eat plants, eat low glycemic so you get less of an insulin spike. They're into ketogenic diet. And if you know, I was not into the ketogenic diet. <laughs> I'm still wondering. I'm beginning to believe it's healthy for your brain at night, and I'll show you how to do that. Um, but the ketogenic diet, if you do it extremely, you eat fat and protein, and you eat almost no carbohydrates. Now, if you have heard of my lectures, the blue zones <laughs> are the healthiest living populations in the world, and they eat 95% plants. They eat a little bit of oil and a little bit of protein. So it's... But this is a paradigm that if you want to improve your brain, you need to follow it. Now, this is a busy slide. Don't obsess over it. But I'm just going to I'm going to zoom in on the left. This is on the left is nighttime. On the right is daytime. These are the different eating styles, and they have a very specific recommendation for you. And I'm going to boil it down to this. Okay, on the left is nighttime. On the right is daytime. This is the typical way that we eat. The, the uh, three big red circles are meals, and the little yellow circles are snacks. Okay. They say this is part of the problem, and they want you to eat to the right of that. And this is, this is what it means. They, the ketogenic, keto, ketoflex 12-3, the 12 means... For 12 hours during your 24-hour cycle at night, you should not eat any nutritional thing whatsoever. No calories go past. You can drink water if you want. Uh, Jackie and I used to drink wine at night. <laughs> First of all, alcohol is bad for your brain. It can help you get to sleep, but then it wakes you up in the middle of the night. Al uh, alcohol is bad for the sugar. <laughs> it's bad for your... But anyway, nothing at night. And then either two or three meals, but you should not eat for three hours before you go to sleep. I actually now believe, and what happens is if you go without fuel for a while, your body uses up your glycogen stores and begins burning fat and makes ketone bodies. You go into ketosis at night. I think that's probably very beneficial because what happens is your brain cleans itself at night. And if you, if you stoke it with some calories, it can't clean itself as well. So if a person simply did this, and the people who have APO4 two copies, have to actually try to be in ketosis more than 12 hours a day. That's a, there's a description in the book of that. Because they need more time for their brain, brain to clean itself. But here's what Jackie and I are now trying to do. We try to eat one or two meals, no snacks in between. Again, you don't have to be obsessive compulsive about this. This is in general healthy. Okay? But, and then you don't eat for three hours before you go to bed. And then for 12 hours, you eat nothing. Okay? And they say the meals ideally should be at least five hours apart. Um, that's their recommendation. If all of us did that, and, you know, it makes sense to me. My, kind of my paradigm is the native in the middle of the Africa, China, India, it wasn't there perfectly healthy, but they often ate a healthy way. And what it many of them at night, when the sun went down, they go to sleep. You know, sun woke, you know, sun woke them up in the morning. But so that's the kind of eating style that you know. There's a lot of populations where they eat 11 or 12 at night. It's not good for your brain. Okay. Bre the Bredesen protocol for me has now become the gold standard. 
and it's very specific. It'll tell you what your vitamin D level will be. What do you do with this? Okay, again, I say get the book, look at it, digest it. It's a very well-written book. It'll give you the story of how this all came about. Try to implement as much as you can, but the program is to go through a diagnostic evaluation that Jackie and I have probably had about 25 lab tests. I don't think I've ever had that many lab tests in my life. We've checked our toxins. We've checked our noses. Now we've got to check our house for mold, things like that. You can think, man, this is really complicated. But what it does is it goes into creating an individualized therapeutic plan for each person. And it involves some software that you put in every finding you have. You're supposed to do basal body temperatures, all this stuff. And then you put it into this, and your computer gives you a description of you. At the top is the, the analysis of where you are in this from bad to optimal. The word is optimal. Are all your systems optimal? And then what they break it down to is this person has toxicity as their main driver. Okay. Their second driver is trophic loss. Their, your brain is missing some of the things it needs to be healthy. Third, glycotoxic. Again, uh, what, what they recommend you do in the printout, let me just go through this. Okay, inflammation and vascular. These are all modifiable. And what they do is they give you everything you can. It's a progressive thing. So, and they, they will print out a detailed... This is what you need to do. Now, taking supplements and vitamins was against my nutritional religion. <laughs> I'm repenting now of that. This is very heavy on things to take. It just is. Okay. Um, if you know anything about functional medicine, these are what it does. Some of these statements may mean nothing to you. Uh, optimize nutrition, balance hormones. They will check every hormone you have. And if it's outside the optimal range, they will not necessarily say take this hormone, but they will improve your metabolic status to where some of those hormones then come into balance again or optimized. If they are not, then they may give you bioidentical hormones. Reduce inflammation, fix digestion. That's a nice big vague thing. It's, there's a lot to that. Enhance detoxification, boost energy metabolism, calm the mind. I'm not copying your mind here today. but And supplements are very heavy. Lots of things. Lots of herbs and spices. Um, but, and it, like I said, it can take three to six months. Although, Dale Bredesen told of an immersion he ran. He's out in Novato, California. And he, he gathered a group of people, and he had them involved in immersion where he keeps them in this hotel, he feeds them. He, you know, a lot of this is lifestyle changes. So you have to be taught how do you change your lifestyle. That's not easy. But he talked about a woman who came from a nursing home who could hardly say a sentence. Four days into this program, she was starting to speak in ways she hadn't for years. It's like, now, don't expect that, but that's the kind of thing this can do. But he says, when you begin this program, you've got to live this lifestyle hardcore for three to six months before you can say it does or doesn't work. And this group is very much into figuring out why it's not working. The number one reason it's not, why it's not working, people aren't doing it. It's not going to work in the box. You've got to take it out and use it. So this is about reversing. Interesting. He uses another word on the front, preventing. Hey, anybody interested in preventing their mental decline? Okay, lifestyle medicine with toxins and genes and some diagnostic evaluation. What about prevention? Can this prevent Alzheimer's? Well, if it's the key to health in your brain, guess what? That's prevention. So I would say this book uh, is very helpful to figuring out what you need to do um, to prevent. And I mentioned this already. We all know about colonoscopies. <laughs> Most of us think are over 50. Uh, I've had two or three. Okay, you're supposed to get one. Now, it doesn't prevent colon cancer. It diagnoses it early. You know, prevention is not screening. Prevention is keeping it from ever happening in the first place, but colonoscopy finds polyps and things like that. 
But the recommendation is when you're 50, you get your first one. If you have no problems, every 10 years. Dale Bredesen recommends a cognoscopy. <laughs> and they're not going to stick a scope in your, up in your brain. But he recommends going through this protocol when you're 45 or 50 because you will already find what the future holds and what you need to work on. Is this a manual for do-it-yourself? It could be. <laughs> it's cheaper. Uh, let me, again, I don't want to confound you, but notice if you look in here in some of the articles, you'll find this list. It's in the book. And the first one, two, three, four, five, six things are all lifestyle. And they are optimize your diet, minimize simple carbohydrates. 63% of the American diet is simple carbohydrates. White bread, we love it. No. Okay, but it's killing us, not just our brains, but it's killing the rest of us. Enhance autophagy, that's uh, program cell death through ketosis. Give your brain the right environment where it can get rid of the bad things in it. Reduce stress, that's easy to say. <laughs> uh, chill out. Uh, optimize sleep. One of, these, one of the things he said, if you have sleep apnea and it's not diagnosed, your brain will not get better. And some, of, some people don't know they have, even their spouses don't know they have uh, sleep apnea. Exercise, a big part of this. We all know that. We all know we should exercise. Uh, Wes Youngberg taught Jackie and I, the best thing you can do for type 2 diabetes, which neither of us have, we are hardly having any insulin resistance, is walk after each meal for 10 to 20 minutes. It's the most beneficial thing you can do for glucose metabolism is walk. Um, now, that's a lifestyle thing. And when the winter comes up and it's freezing outside, how do you do it? Brain stimulation. There's programs that if you get into this thing, they tell you brain HQ and luminosity. You need to exercise your brain every day uh, by playing piano. Right? <laughs> of course, you've been playing since you were three years old, right? Okay. So, and then there's other things, and this is too complicated to go through, but you look at it, and you know, there's some things you can do um, on these things, but again, go to the book and find out what it is. So, for me, I mean, what happened to me, now I gave a lecture six months ago. I reviewed everything I knew about Alzheimer's. I came here and gave it. And then in June, all of a sudden I hear about the Bredesen Protocol, I said to Jackie, Oop, let's change our direction. So we went down, I got trained, we're going through the protocol, because I thought, you know, it would really help if I know what it's like to go through this protocol. Uh, one of the big questions is how much does it cost? It's not cheap. I cannot tell you how much it costs. It depends on your insurance, it depends on a lot of things. Not only the diagnosis, how about the treatment? <laughs> you know, if they want you to take 10, 15 things, you want high grade, you don't want to just go down to the drugstore and buy this and that. Those things are beneficial, but you gotta figure out which ones are the best ones. But but let me give you an example. Vitamin D, I'm a doctor, I happen to know. We went to a conference, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine in DC in the end of July, and they had one of the world's experts on vitamin D speaking. Well, if you know anything about vitamin D, it's across the board. It's not settled science, although with some people it's really hardcore, they know for sure, but vitamin D, almost all of us are low on it. Okay, should we all take it? Well, there's disagreement. Well, I can tell you, if I take the Bredesen Protocol as my gold standard, they can tell you, if you want optimal brain health, your vitamin D level needs to be 50 to 80. I saw something today, 50 to 100. 100 is top normal, and 20 is low normal. But if you want your brain to be optimal, what they recommend is test your vitamin D3 level, then take some, and six months later, make sure you're up in the, the optimal range. So that's an example of something that can be done, and there's, there's exact levels for whether it's thyroid, all the different things, TSH, T3, T4, um, thyroid antibodies, and then Three kinds of estrogen, testosterone, pregnenolone, progesterone, <laughs> DHEA, uh, all these things. They'll check every one of them. And that's what we'll do. They'll come out with a detailed thing, some of which you can go to the store and buy, or you can get from a good source and do. Some of it you need to get 
go through a practitioner. But that's this is now the gold standard for me. And you know, even though ideologically there's a few things in here I'm not used to and I'm wondering about, if somebody says, let's do this, I would say do exactly what the book says. This is a group also that's actively working on this. This is not going to be the, the final word. This group is, I've seen any, even as, we've, as I've been involved in, I've seen some corrections where they've said, okay, we used to recommend this, we're kind of narrowing it to this now. This is optimal. So this is a group that I have the confidence they are going to be very active. And here's what's interesting is Dale Bredesen and his group did not take this to the medical centers. Nothing against med Western medicine. But he basically published, he, in fact, he's a neurologist who was a researcher, worked in the lab for years and years and years, and he says, I never imagined I would be treating patients. But what happened is they started developing this they tried to get a clinical trial in Australia, and the people said, you obviously don't know that you have to have one variable in a clinical trial. And he said, you obviously don't understand Alzheimer's. That's not the way it works. And so he started having people coming to him, and he reluctantly started applying the protocol to them. He got into it that way, and now his name is on the front of it. But, but they are in the process of improving this as much as can be. So, so that's, this is brand new. This is hope. Uh, this is not a guarantee for anybody, but this is what I'm doing with my own life and my own brain. <laughs> I want to keep it. I want, actually, I would like to make my brain better. That's one of the things that's interesting. Some of the people got better than they had ever been in their life because, in fact, all of us have dementogens in our environment, in our, in our um, makeup, and that's what we need is to... So, I'm going to end right here.